Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for switching off Donald Trump. Uh, it was fascinating watching him yesterday in that press conference, but I think uh, we want to hear Hugo for the next uh, first bit of this morning. Some of you might know Professor Hugo Kenham, uh, and others might not know, so I'm going to introduce him very briefly. Um, first thing is to say Hugo comes from the Eastern Cape, Lusigi Sig, um, in the eastern part, southeastern part of South Africa. Uh, as regards work, Hugo is a, an associate professor at the University of the Vedvatersrand. Is also the assistant dean of graduate studies in the faculty of the human sciences of humanities. He has been reading uh, some interesting work uh, on waywardness and non-normative lives, um, and he's working on a book uh, on black black deathscapes, which you will have to buy when it comes out. It's a, I've had a bit of it. It's a magnificent piece of writing that uh, brings together uh, science or uh, discipline, scholarship, memoir, landscape writing, uh, as well as Hugo's running. Hugo runs, is a, likes running. Um, it's wonderful. Hugo uh, does, is interested in creative nonfiction. Uh, he writes um, quite a bit when he he feels like it, which I hope he could do it more of that. I, I told him at one moment when we met. Hugo uh, writes in the newspapers, in, in magazines, and it is just amazing to read the work. Um, he has uh, published in the Dubois Review, um, in other journals on race, on African studies, on psychology. He has a recent piece, I think, on grandfathers, uh, a co-authored piece on, on grandfathers um, in the general emotion um, space and society. Uh, before he became, before he pivoted to scholarship, Hugo was working as a as a, in the Office of Transformation and Equity at the same university. He lives in Johannesburg. Hugo will take about 20, 25 minutes, maybe, maybe even 30, uh, just making an input uh, on, on what he has been um, thinking, reflecting on, writing about. As I said, part of, of what Hugo is presenting, and I, I, and I hope many of you have seen the piece on which this is based uh, is on Black Death. I should mention this could not have come at a better time. Yesterday, Oprah Winfrey uh, spoke to African Americans about being uh, aware that this is not something out there. The Black Death uh, coronavirus is affecting Black Americans disproportionately. I think in Chicago, about 68% who are dying. Uh, Amanda Correction here, dying or infected are African Americans, while um, they make only about uh, is it twenty eight percent or just under thirty percent or about the of the population of Chicago. Uh, the hospitalizations um, in in all of the U.S. of African Americans or Black people there are about thirty three percent, while they make a, a, a much lower number of uh, compared to that. In South Africa, we know that, uh, which which is the center of, I guess, Hugo's writing. We know about the death of black people from HIV, uh, mostly disproportionately. And of course, across Africa, about uh, uh, death from Ebola, from preventable causes. Um, and Hugo uh, will be, I guess, touching on that. Hugo, welcome and thank you for doing this. We can't hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kupano. So, uh, and, and thank you to Shanaz who 
who initially um, invited me to do this talk, which I initially thought was directed uh, or in conversation with students. Uh, and, I, and I note that a number of people on here are colleagues from different places, friends, uh, and even former students, which surprises me, given that I thought uh, you read enough of me. Uh, so, just some context to this. I wrote the piece at the beginning of the lockdown, not as an academic exercise, but as an emotional response to try and externalize some of the despair that I was feeling and that I think many of us are feeling at the moment. I'd probably write the piece slightly differently now. Um, this is partly why I, I did ask that people read the piece alongside that of Uradhanti Roy. Uh, Roy helps us to expand our thinking to consider India, a place of about a billion and a half people. Uh, and she shows how COVID-19 has fed into existing fissures uh, that in, in that society. So we see how Muslims are now seen as COVID-19. Literally, uh, you can replace the word Muslim with COVID-19. Um, ironically, Africans uh, in China have come to represent COVID-19. And you will see the irony of this, of course, is that the virus originates from China. Um, so those most loathed in society are often seen as always already infected. Uh, recall the videos of domestic workers and gardeners in Ilovo just here in Johannesburg being mm. trained to wash their hands uh, it, while singing Shosha Loza. Um, be, and how they had come to represent the disease even before it became a widespread phenomenon when it was still a traveler's disease, people who had traveled abroad. Um, so there are people who are marked as always infected. Uh, but beside, for, uh, aside from the multiple strands there of argument that can be pursued in relation to COVID-19, my primary interest was to just foreground mourning in times of uh, epidemics. I also wanted to foreground the compounding dyings, and dyings here I, I add an S, a plural, uh, that Black people have to, that have lived through, that we have lived through. Uh, and we might come to, we, we, in this, there, there are many, but we think of Haiti, and I write about Haiti in this piece, and, and that morning or that afternoon of January 10, 2010, when about 230 people died. Um, the malaria that kills thousands of people every year, the floods, the droughts, the floods in Mozambique right next door, uh, Boy Bidong, the Bisho massacre, uh, and, and there are many others. So one could say though that people die every day, uh, that death is death and that all people die, we all destined to die. Um, but as Copano has said at the, with the introduction, that, that black people die disproportionately more. Uh, currently in the US, the epicenter of death at the moment in the world, it's African Americans who are dying more and Hispanic communities. Death always latches onto existing social features of inequality. Health outcomes are racialized. Um, so, so we're not any more predisposed to die, but society is structured in a way that, that uh, leads to more death. Epidemics are of course not new. Uh, in 1918, we had the influenza epidemic or the Spanish flu that killed 300,000 people in South Africa. A song composed by Ruben Aluza, 
has the following verse. Konyaka 1918, Sak Edo Ukufa, Kui Influenza. In 1918, we were finished and ravaged by death called influenza. Um, and we and I and I repeat that verse of the song because often uh, black history is only recorded through popular cultural forms by black people, such as music. Uh, in the 1300s, there was a play called The Black Death. Uh, that killed millions of people in North Africa and Europe. So besides the huge number of the dead, thinking about the influenza epidemic, Howard Phillips, uh, the, the influenza epidemic of 1918, Howard Phillips introduced the term epidemic expediency. This refers to the acts that government authorities, authorities resort to as a cover for the things that they can't do during normal time. Epidemic expediency allowed the city of Cape Town to finally evict uh, refugees from the Methodist church. They couldn't uh, evict them before this. About that, Ibatem John Dodo has been waging a war for two decades with the city of Durban, Itegui municipality, and Kennedy Road, uh, Cato Manor. Uh, and government hasn't succeeded in evicting them. Those who have been evicted have been put in transit camps, which are supposed to be temporary camps, but become permanent camps. But ep epidemic expediency, expediency through the national disaster may allow government to finally evict them into shanty towns uh, far away from centers of work and livelihood. So if we imagine people as already contagious, we can justify anything in the public interest. We see the disruption of funerals on social media and the denigration of the sacred, the rites that people perform at funerals, uh, with the spilling of traditional beers, spilling of food uh, in a time of great hunger. But my primary interest is in mourning, and I want to just uh, move there now to think about this moment. Claudia Rankin state that the black condition of uh, the condition of black life is that of mourning. It's a it's a it's a quite a significant statement, and I know that it can be countered, and I'll and I'll come to that. So, in addition to the endless dying, we have to accommodate in our psyche. We have to accommodate mourning. Uh, so. We, we have to give mourning a space in our lives in order to integrate it into our lives. But what happens when we have so much dying in our histories, right? Marikana, Shabal, Langa, the Pondo Revolt. Uh, and, and so just as, as an aside, I found myself uh, sometimes and and this might be at the risk of exposure uh crying when watching or reading film uh, uh, reading books uh or, or watching movies on the rwanda genocide where a million people were killed uh or the american movies on the american south or movies about of apartheid these some of these predate me. Of course, I remember others, uh, the Rwandan genocide, uh, aspects of apartheid. But the, the emotional response that those events elicit are an indication that historical sedimented traumas are present today and can target you un at unexpected moments. Uh, so, this raises a few questions uh, for me that I'm going to just raise uh, now. How do we mourn uh, our collective past? Uh, how do we mourn the millions lost to AIDS deaths from the dying epoch, right? Those of us who lived through the height of the AIDS deaths that uh, people estimate to run into almost uh, um, 300,000 or more, 
uh, are significant uh, deaths. And these carry on, of course, but there was a moment of concentrated dying. More immediately, in the context of COVID-19, how do, how do we prepare for death? How do we prepare our minds for the possible death of loved ones? How does the prospect of mass dying tug at wounds of losses both in our families and in our communities? How does our class position and that of our families inflict our fears and anxieties? So some of us might sit in the middle class, but our families sit squarely in the working class that has less protections from dying. Um, so while, while death is a real prospect for most of us here, it is potentially more real more real for others for whom phys physical distancing remains impossible. Just yesterday watching the news, uh, I saw a group of people in Alexandria, which is a few kilometers from where I live, uh, waiting for an NGO to bring food because they had promised to bring more this week. Uh, and the proximity and the shouting and, and journalists were asking, are you not afraid, afraid of COVID-19? And they said, we are not afraid of COVID-19, we want food now. So, so the calculations that we make in relation to dying are made from very particular positions which are classed and racialized and gendered as well. So how does class and geography, geography inflict our relationship to dying? How does the race link us historically to death? What happens when our grieving is disrupted in the context of pandemics? Um, melancho melancholia is in part disrupted mourning in the context of pandemics. Uh, melancholia, uh, what happens is also when, when mourning, when the object of loss is not acknowledged or recognized. And during pandemics, there is no space to pause for individual loss to be recognized. We think of loss in a large grand scale. Um, so so to, to think then to give, how do we give mourning a space uh, with all of these restrictions that we currently have. In the context of, of, of mass dying, loss is unexceptional and bereavement has little space. When we cannot travel to funerals or we are surplus, surplus to the 50 people, which is the maximum in South Africa, but uh, in other places that number is less and we see with the burials happening in New York that there are no families in attendance at those funerals. So, so when the dying increase to a scale that is not sustainable for people to attend, for families not to attend, for friends not to attend. Uh, to mourn collectively, we have to look at the body to witness the reality of the death. Uh, and this is embedded in most of our cultures the looking upon the body. Uh, and that opportunity is taken away in, in mass dying. Uh, Emma Till's body in the United States, Emma Till who was killed, uh, became in the African-American community, one of the first public uh, visibilizations of death besides people hanging from trees in the lynchings. Uh, so, because the, his mother insisted that his body that had been brutalized um, by the Ku Klux Klan and, 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 and American Southern uh, racists be seen by the media. And the thing of the body often galvanizes to resist and to assert our, our humanity. Um, so I say all of this uh, in relation to, to, to say that if what we have seen in the world 
occurring in these math times. We should brace ourselves here for the coming of yet another epoch of dying on top of what we already have. The condition of black death that, that Claudia Rankin refers to as a condition of, of dying is also uh, the condition of joy, right? Uh, black culture is buoyant, it's joyful, it's vibrant, but vibrancy does not shut out the place or replace uh, the stench of dying, right? People's bodies smell in mass death. It, it's also, uh, it's also our proximity to death that makes us laugh as much as we do. Uh, so you know the comedy in, in black culture. Um, that we laugh with such abandon, even though we cry, right? The place of ancestors in our cultures, I suspect is so heightened and important to us because life and death are so proximate, are so related and entwined in our cultures for a reason. Be to accommodate the mass dyings, we have to make our ancestors part of our cosmology, or else it becomes unthinkable, unbearable to think that people who die disappear into the ether. Um, so, so I want to, to pause there um, and just maybe a comment on, on these images. Uh, they can potentially cause, I know, a lot of violence. Uh, because they they are people in the world, and I get I got them off uh, off the internet tracing with the search words of of black death and disasters. But I want to bring them into our consciousness, into our conversation, to link us historically in the present to these sedimented dyings, these events that become part of our DNA. So Haiti that is on the screen right now, is part of our consciousness for a number of reasons, including being the black, first black republic, but it's also part of our consciousness because in 2010, the unthinkable happened that left devastation in its wake. And I, and I left out images that show how trucks, trucks that carry garbage and that carry gravel had to carry bodies in mass and just dump them into landfill in order to quickly dispose of bodies that were rotting uh, in huge numbers. And the devastation that characterized Haiti is the devastation that characterizes the world. We don't think of Haiti in the way that we think of COVID-19 because COVID-19 is a reality for all of us from all classes, admittedly to different extents, but uh, deaths like those in Haiti, like those in Mozambique to flooding and elsewhere, uh, can be pushed aside in our consciousness. Uh, COVID-19 doesn't allow us that luxury. So I wanted to bring in these deaths, these expendable bodies, disposable bodies, that are often not made part of world consciousness into this conversation about COVID that forces us to reckon with death. Uh, thank you, Kupan. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Hugo. Um, I think you have done uh, some work subsequent to writing that piece, which was, as you say, came out of your own uh, despair. And thank you for that. Really appreciate it. I have, uh, it looks like a, a large number of points that I want to pull out before we we allow. Um, we we have a good time. Uh, we allow people to, to ask questions. We discussed with Hugo yesterday 
a folk that what Hugo will 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 try to answer uh, and respond to the to some of the questions and, and comments. But of course, you can put the questions to all of us, the 80 or so of us who are here, um, and we will direct it through me. If if Hugo says, well, I've answered this, but you know anybody wants to to come in there. Um, I have eight points. They look like a lot, but actually they are just one sentence that I want to draw out. Uh, so bear with me. I just I just figured out something, Hugo, in your presentation. I've known a little bit about this. But my first point is is that um, Hugo is is trying to connect black people here in South Africa with black people all around the world. Uh, that's it. That's a. This is why you like. Is it Howard or or Harvard? Howard, or, uh, both of them actually. That's why you like spending time over there and the Dubois people. He and one of the things that I I never quite clicked. It just clicked while you're presenting. You are making space for black studies in South African psychology, and I'm I'm wondering why you don't do it with with uh, with much more energetically, much more forcefully. Uh, to uh, there are exactly two papers in South Africa. Two papers. Uh, on black black psychology, by the way, um, or it is papers that mention the words black psychology, and the in the title or in the abstract, um, and one of them is your colleague uh, and your dean, uh, your, your uh, close person to you there. So Hugo is making space for black studies in South African psychology and South African psychology in global black studies. It just struck me that as part of this connecting Haiti Africans in China. Malaria, Mozambique, um, of course, all around around the world. And thank you for that, Hugo. Second, uh, the point has become clear. I referred to Oprah Winfrey earlier on, and some of people have been saying this, like uh, Ntiki Mazwai, who's a as a poet, has said this. But death latches to inequality. It does. It, it it's it's always been doing this. As, as a matter of fact, black like lives are situated in this in this. In this historical inequality of uh, around colonial difference, uh, where black people are the below of the world. Third point, the I the, this. Thank you for the word e epidemic expediency. You're saying e that allows governments to carry out certain acts against the people, and this is what happened in in Cape Town a few days ago. Uh, but it happens all over all over the world. And you mentioned Abashali Bism John Dollar, which is a an advocacy, an activist group that's been uh, championing and fighting for the rights of people in in informal settlement. Um, uh, fourth point uh, and the fifth point go together that the uh, you, you reference that line, the, the condition of black life is mourning. But you also connect, you says, but that also doesn't mean there's no joy in black life. Black life is joy. I have been hearing this a bit uh, from Francis uh, um, uh, the, the, at Columbia, who says, who's speaking about decolonial joy. So the black life is joy, but that does not replace the stench of death. That was the fourth and fifth point. The sixth point uh, is, is that, that I, I want to draw uh, to people's attention is this, that, that race how you ask the question, how does race connect to death? But it connects to the earlier point about inequality, that race itself was an ideology of death. The moment uh, the colonizer and the colonial uh, arsenal, as it were, moved into the new world, into Africa, into Asia, into, into the Americas, uh, death was already written there. When the ships in the you know the, the passage when the ships are moving out of Africa, bodies were just thrown aboard into into the seas. Uh, so that was written already right there. That's why black black bodies when they die doesn't cause as much as much uh, of uh, the news the the eight o'clock seven o'clock news around the world as the death of white bodies. This is this is well known. I mean it's not it's not a provocative thing. But sometimes when you mention people act as if it's it's a new thing. Seventh point, laws, and eighth point. Probably this is this uh, uh, 
It's such an important point that you brought to our attention that loss in these times is unexceptional. What you're saying also is that the individual does not matter. At the African American, uh, the Museum of, of Culture and History in Washington, D.C., I was struck a few years back when I uh, I went over. I, I was always wanting to see the building itself, but also the how how that that was was put together. They have a a, a you might miss it. It's a it's a it's a, a grave during during again what you might as well call a pandemic. A letter from a father. Just one little note. Just mourning the death of 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 his of his child, and that struck me incredibly, particularly around around black death that indeed um, because we are used we are made to be used to death so much we don't take time to mourn that was the seventh point the last point that connects to that is how then how do we process this this death if we can't mourn and thank you hugo for the pictures and for a wonderful uh, provocative uh, food uh, uh, for that food for thought we're open for questions, for comments, uh, folk. Hello, you can come in anytime and ask questions if you can hear us. Gubano, perhaps people can also write them in the chat option there. If, if they right. feel they don't want to speak. Right. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. No, no, uh, okay, it's Tenji, Tenji Mayua here. I'm sorry I joined uh, late. So, you know, I had a meeting before this and had to to rush here and you know technology played games and thank you for this oh, really appreciate. so i only caught the the seminar towards the end and i'm just wondering to what extent uh, has there been an analysis on in particular you know women's bodies and how there's a, a triple or even multi, multiple uh, victimization even on, 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 you know, during these times on women's bodies, because we know generally uh, that's an issue that we always moan about. And I'm just wondering if there, there's been that analysis, concentration on it. Thank you, Tenji. Uh, Hugo, you want to respond to that? Sure. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Tenji. Uh, so, uh, this this is a really important question and one that I did think about uh, and I think about constantly. Uh, so, women's bodies get very easily written out, uh, and 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 it's important. I think you and part of your intervention, I think, uh, is that we always hold the intersectionalities in tension because black bodies are never just black bodies. They are always gendered and classed simultaneously. Um, and, they, you know, and one can do a very focused kind of uh, thinking about this. And there are people who do it. So Sadia Hartman, for example, uh, does this beautiful tracing uh, in, in, in her recent book called Wayward Lives of an African-American uh, black woman. Uh, and she uses figures like Du Bois, but she concentrates specifically on, on mostly young black women and how they were experimenting with life um, throughout you know, the particular historical moment she's interested in. And how that, that's always inflected somewhat differently from men, moments of overlap, but but they are quite distinct issues. So the place of black women, for example, in work, uh, in service of, in the proximity of the home, right, on the slave plantations, 
but, but also how disease inflicts black women's bodies differently. So we know in this moment that men are dying up to 70% or constituting the COVID-19 deaths, up, up to 70% of, of them are male, right? So, so men seem to have some people, something going on here. Uh, but but uh, generally though, uh, even if we think about lineages of dying in our communities and families, and we think of childbirth and how that the forms of dying there are linked to socioeconomic uh, issues, access to to hospitals and resources. Um, true, true. So, yeah. So, so thank you. That that's an important intervention and one that I think we have to constantly keep in tension. Can I just make a a quick one, Tenji. I know that uh, today or tomorrow, you might have seen this, the the, uh, uh, the na national um, initiative on 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 gender-based violence is having a a a, a mm. gender analysis of the pandemic. So I would encourage people to attend if if I get a time. I will also because there's another one coming up, and there's a group called Men Engage. Uh, uh, it's a it's 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 basically a, a gender egalitarian, progressive masculinities and and uh, grouping of NGOs. They have started putting up articles uh, that analyzes gender from a gender perspective, the pandemic. And, and I would encourage people also to look into that. And absolutely, in our country, we have seen this multiple injuries that you refer to around what's been happening within uh, during the lockdown. Uh, as, as a result of the pandemic. Thank you, Tenji. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else with uh, with a comment and a question and reflection? You, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hawk the space. At the time that I, I joined, uh, while it, at some point uh, I could not um, here was battling with uh, with my many speakers here. I saw a, a pictorial of the Rwanda the Rwandanese genocide. I mean, what what was the point about that? Were you drawing correlations? And you know, because I have recently thought about much as we 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 have in such a sad situation where so many people's lives have, have been lost, but. The concentration, possibly because the entire world is involved in this, and the, the concern and the efforts are, are relative to the 1994 uh, one, or prior to that, the, the Rwandanese one, is just comparing the two makes one to, to want to have, raise one's hand and have a huge gripe around how even racial and spatial um, inequalities tend to be highlighted in how we deal with not just the pandemic, but the, the bodies that are dead. You go. Sure. Um, so I'm not entirely uh, clear about the last part of the question, but, but just to maybe say part of the point of, of the the slideshow and in fact the, the talk is is to connect uh, black dyings as an as a kind of transnational phenomenon, a global phenomenon that is not that that does not of, of course exceptionalize the small spaces that we live in, but that sees them as as connected. Um, and, and, and this idea of, of global blackness, uh, that's, that's important uh, to me. So, so part, partly, I mean, Rwanda for me is, is very important and, and I've been into those, uh, into those math graves uh, and what they do is show us a lot of background. Uh, how every day. How yeah, we have a lot of feedback. Could people not just mute their mic? No. 
mute your speaker, please. We had like a talk. No, it won't be. Yeah. The internet is here. Yeah. And let's mute all listeners. Okay. Hello, could you mute, please? It's technology bit there. Yeah. Okay, okay maybe just to round off this point um, of, of, for me is, is that we we sh well i believe that we should constantly remember and connect our our dyings right in the plural um and and it's it's partly to honor right it's partly remembering is partly to honor it's partly and, and as i gave those examples of how you can be watching a movie or reading a book and suddenly you're overwhelmed by by tears um is that these things are always part of us, uh, and we and and turning our backs to it, uh, peripheralizing it, or, or, or provincializing the dying, uh, does a disservice to our collective humanity. Um, but anyway, Kopano, maybe you. Yeah. Can you just follow up on on that? Uh, you, you know. Uh, by the way, I completely my my sense is that, but I have one new questions but the other one that connects to what what uh, professor mayua was saying is how then do you process the the death of the individual when there's when there's so much death around i mean you know that's the connection well how do you in in rwanda what they have done is you know every april and this year they couldn't do it is they have this march they go to the stadium uh, paul gagame comes comes in and there's a uh, this this con this morning, but there are there are there are there are after effects uh, because this is a national morning rather than morning on the on the on a small scale of the people who are close to you. So how do we do that then? And then there's a second sure. part. A small question is is I don't know about the people who are listening here. I mean, every time when I was when I was watching right from the beginning and all of us uh try to be as productive as possible but I, as we heard earlier when somebody was listening to donald trump you watch these numbers when you were list, watching wuhan in january and then now in the us the fear i live under about if this comes to our country to our informal settlements to uh, djibouti to uh, mauritania it's gonna be oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a it's it's just so the fear I live under every day watching mm -hmm. this, and this morning again mm -hmm. I went to Weldometers well just to what, look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking mm -hmm. for somebody who doesn't pray enough, I'm I don't know what's happening, um, but there's there's fortune here, there's God because this is gonna be a mess. It's gonna be mm -hmm. hectic. So those are two questions: the fear. Uh, I can't even process it, but the processing of death, how do you do it in these times? Sure. And and again, you know, I don't have the the answers here, and I'm glad for other people to pitch in. Um, so so and how do we deal with the fear with also at the same time not making people already contagious? Because there's ways that we treat people when we imagine them. It, and our fear is being projected onto them as already. Yeah. Um, so, so how, yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a delicate balance. And I agree with government interventions largely, you know, about traveling. We couldn't hear you there, Hugo, yeah. a little bit. Right, sorry. I, I got muted. muted. Yeah, you got muted. Somebody muted everybody. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're so, so while I agree with the interventions that are happening, the danger of the interventions is exactly the thing about um, individual mourning becomes uh, 
is made impossible in the moment, right? So we can't attend our families. We become surplus numbers, uh, our family funerals. Uh, and that does something to, so we can, after this is done, maybe we'll have a collective day of mourning, right? But that, that doesn't resolve the issue of the mourning that usually happens in the moment. Um, and it's the tension we've got to live with uh, in this time. As to how families in Rwanda, for example, might honor individuals, and I don't think the Kigami government possibly, uh, I think the national mourning thing that they do has a space and it's quite productive, but I, I do wish that there was an emphasis on family, on villages doing their own ceremonies. Uh, rememberings within families that does not get consumed by national mourning. Um, mm. it, it's something we've, we've, we've got to sit through. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo, so much for that. Uh, can I just make a suggestion uh, while you're at it? The Psychological Society of South Africa is asking people to do podcasts for five minutes. Uh, I, it just struck me uh, that this would be such a productive uh, podcast if you were to do it. Shanaz, the, the incoming president, is here as well. Uh, about about the the, the space, a kind of a, a, a verbalized letter to the government. You, we have to find a space now, later if not now, for people to mourn. We have to mm. do that. I, I, I'm feeling a, a little emotional right now. You're quite right. I mean, once again, the fear I have, my people, my clan, my mother lives in Johannesburg. At the moment, and she's, uh, you know, she's old, so the fear that she could, and she has underlying illnesses already, that I couldn't travel as the only child to travel to her if she was to pass because of this, it is just terrifying. Uh, so I think all of all of people who are listening might, some of you might have that that feeling as well that you might, you might, uh, because there was no pl plane, I have to drive, I have to find a way to get there. So that fear, but also the, the space then later to mourn, even if you had gone with the, with the you, you've been there with 10, 20, less than 50 people. I think it would be great for you to, to, to think for, about doing a short piece, a podcast on, on this possible, this space to mourn later, if not now. I'm putting you on the spot there, I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry. I, I know, and I'm not a psychologist. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so also also math grades, right? This this yeah. idea and, and when does math die, math grades become inevitable. And and, and math grades are, are counter to the ways in which many of our communities bury their people and what and where the grave is located. So the picture on the screen right now is close to where I live. And and a, a grave it's usually next to the homestead. It's usually brought into the cosmological kind of life of the family. Uh, it's a place you walk to. It's a place that becomes part of your everyday consciousness. And when that opportunity is taken away in, in these moments, what, what, what does that do to the ways in which villages see themselves and families see themselves? in relation to the ancestors um, that connection is disrupted by moments of pandemics uh, and it's not there's no solution but it's acknowledging the, the what what these moments do to our lives yes thank you we have about five minutes to go any any more comments thank you again hugo any questions any reflections are welcome. I've got a question, uh, 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 It's just fr from what Hugo's saying. I'm just thinking that we we need to to also equally, you know, possible through through societies like the Psychological Society of South Africa, uh, tap into uh, the resilience. Uh, is somebody in the back saying something? Mm. Okay. Just go ahead. Uh, just about the local, the, 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 the local knowledge is 
which may be indigenous or contemporary, as well as resilience banks that um, the black person has often uh, in her, his community in terms of dealing with these things. Uh, much of this is global, we tend to, to, to be looking too far and for answers from structures that are not structures that we used to and not structures of um, you know, internal, intra, um, personal, um, local structures that have made the black person to be this resilient. So without saying, I'm expecting Hugo to, to respond to this, but just, it's, it's a thought that's coming to my mind that uh, we, we have these banks of knowledges and ways of dealing with, with such circumstances that I'm just wondering how often do we, if ever, go to such in instances where we have such a, a pandemic that goes beyond just the local. Yeah. There was a second comment in the background from someone else. Yeah. Okay, I, I had uh, I had somebody wanting to say something. We have about three minutes uh, to go. Hello. Any? Hello. Oh. Hi. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I put. There's two. There's two of you, but just go ahead. Whoever wants to start. So, Hugo, I wanted to ask about what now. I think beyond morning, what we need to we need to, especially as a black population, get our act together so that we die no more. I acknowledge the agency around uh, making sure that our journey is really part of human progress in mourning, in according as uh, opportunities to grieve and to mourn. We acknowledge that, but we know that our mourning mainly is through the structural problems that we inherited for centuries. Surely we need to turn this centuries old black around, and indeed the black death literally. I think we need to know wherever we are assigned as black people that we are deployed. One, to stop the black death, because it can be stopped. Number two, to reconfigure structural inequalities that would get a different foundation than the one that we have, and to start moving forward to not only survive, but thrive as a people. Because for a long time, we're going to be mourning that we are dying. But what is this that we should be doing as a people to avoid more black death? And, and for me, the essence of this cry around mourning and being afforded grief is when are we going to stop grieving? I know in an epidemic we'll stop grieving, but largely the structural issues that we spoke about earlier, why we dying of malaria more, why maternal mortality more, why everything that is black and death is more upon us is because of these structural issues. So what next, Hugo? Any thoughts about what we should be doing to avoid mourning more? Okay, can, I, can you get your name? It sounds like a voice I know, but who, who's this? If, if you don't want to, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hugo, go ahead, please. That's Sam. Yeah. Yeah. With another question, Kobana, I'm aware of the time. Could we just take it as well? Yes. Can we take the other question that was? Uh, um, I that don't really asked? have a question. I don't okay. really have a question. Um, I have a comment. Um, I'm okay. just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I just want to say thank you. Um, this really, um, yeah, took, it, it was traction within my own despair. I currently work as a psychologist, um, usually in, in community um, mental health, but has, I've been redeployed into psychiatry because the, the psychiatrist and the legal personnel are working elsewhere. I've ended up in, in psychogeriatrics where um, there are about 82 um, old people from 60 all the way to about 100 and, and, and again, black, black bodies. Um, and I was asked to give them a frailty score based on how um, frail they would be, uh, they are um, and the ability that to then qualify for respiratory care. Um, this filled me with such deep sorrow um, because it was expected to be a paper exercise. I then interviewed all 82 people and just to um, 
pay homage, give honor to their lives, um, what this means. I also went to find out exactly what a COVID death would look like, and it's it's similar to drowning. Um, and so just ha you go having you talk through this, um, um, yeah, full resonated deeply, and it, I found it to be cathartic and useful um, because more than any. I think I think the time of reflection um, is going to be so important as we move forward. Thank so you thank so you. much for that. Thank you so much. Hugo, you want to close for us, please? Thank you. Um, so, so one of the most frustrating things about about these kinds of things, right, is that the solutions are often not forthcoming, and and. Uh, now I, I want to claim being a psychologist even after denouncing it uh, <laughs> that, that that we are in some ways the mockers up um, of emotion um, and and the witnesses uh, of of things. So yet to the structural conditions, I think some uh, that are, are so important that lead to this dying. Uh, happening. I, I'm, I've become so pessimistic about us being able to to fundamentally reverse the issues um, that we face because it's taken such a long time to put them in place. So I think of Haiti and like here's a struggling country and then on top of it an, an act of God, a natural disaster um, just sets them back another century um, and, and and it's partly because it's when people have been uprooted from the very place that they were from through enslavement and put onto a place that how do we undo that um, but but we from our little corners our solidarities uh, so a colleague that I was talking to last week with Shanaz in Palestine said that his community is dealing with the COVID-19 in a remarkable way because they are so used to being attacked that, that this is just another attack for which their systems that they've put in place and their psyches that they've prepared is enabling them to deal with this. So in some ways, the resilience that I think Tenji was talking about in our communities to be used to this uh, devastation uh, does help us to integrate death into our lives. So, but, but to some I just want to say, yes, uh, among, those among us that are committed to changing the world, we should insist on it and insist that that this should not be our permanent condition. Um, but at the same time, in moments like this, we have to make space for it. I think that last intervention about, about uh, working with old people, right? Preparing old people and yourself for death, what does that look like? Uh, mm. Because the reality is that it likely, it was always likely because of time, but it's been brought forward possibly for many old people that we know and that we love. And how do we prepare for that? Um, so, so just, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that there's still 73 attendees uh, online to, to say thank you from my side. Uh, I, I, I appreciate us coming together to think about something that's not going to leave us happy. But, but, but hopefully leave us thinking uh, uh, and without resorting to denial um as difficult as that is and and thank you Kobano, for, for the facilitation i appreciate you all thank you uh, stay well stay healthy uh, thank you shanaz if you go have a good day bye, -bye.